good evening. I'm sure you remember Halley's Comet, which caused such a tremendous amount of interest way back in 1986. Well, you may like to see the very latest picture of it, taken on January the 10th this year from Chile. And there it is, right in the middle of the picture, that little fuzzy thing surrounded by a circle. It's now a mere inert lump. It's lost its tail, of course. It's more than 1,700 million miles away, about as far away as the planet Uranus, and it's getting further away all the time. And it won't be back until the year 2061. And I mention Halley's Comet because there have been weird and wonderful reports in the press that it may be going to hit the planet Jupiter. This, of course, is complete nonsense. Mind you, there will be a comet impact on Jupiter in July, but that is Comet Shoemaker-Levy, which has already been broken up by Jupiter. And that picture was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. As you can see, the comet has already been disrupted. And when it impacts Jupiter, it will make um, a very large explosion. That, of course, is an artist's impression. In fact, we won't see the impact. It occurs on the far side of Jupiter. But Jupiter spins round very quickly indeed, in less than 10 hours, and the area should be brought back into our view within a few minutes. And there may be a visible marking, we are not sure. Meanwhile, Jupiter can be seen in the morning sky. It's in the constellation of Libra, the scales, quite high up before dawn. And you can't mistake it because it is so bright. Now, this picture was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. Jupiter, remember, has a gaseous surface. You can see there the great red spot below the center and the cloud belts and the bright areas. And the impact area is going to be somewhere around there. We are not sure really what's going to happen. We'll tell you much more about it near the time. But one thing I can tell you, there's going to be no permanent damage to Jupiter, merely a storm there, and certainly, of course, no possible effects upon anything else. So meanwhile, let's come very much nearer home. And we're going back to the moon. At this stage, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. John Mason. Good evening, John. Now, this is, um, it's a long time now since men last walked on the lunar surface. Yes, a little over 21 years ago, in December 1972, two of the crew members of Apollo 17, Eugene Scher Cernan and Jack Harrison Schmidt, they became the last two men on the moon. And here you can see Jack Schmidt, the first trained geologist to go to the moon, dwarfed there by that huge rock. He's down there at the lower left. And I well remember the excitement when he discovered some orange soil on a, a trip now near Shorty Crater. I remember that very well. We all got very excited about that, and for the moment, you know, I at least thought it might indicate traces of um, quite recent volcanic activity, and that would have interested me a great deal. But in fact, um, it was a bit disappointing. It turned out to be merely due to a very ancient orange glassy beads. Well, as you say, that was Apollo 17. That was the end of the series. Yes, there were three more Apollo flights planned, but they were cancelled. There was dwindling public and political support. And, of course, there was always the danger that if the landing had gone wrong or the ascent engine had failed, then it would have been disaster. So Apollo 17 was the last Apollo mission. But we have had three unmanned Russian probes, Luna 16, 20 and 24, which went to the moon, collected samples and came back. And altogether, they brought back 11 ounces of lunar material. But the Apollo astronauts between them brought back no less than 840 pounds of lunar material. Yes, indeed. They brought back 2,196 different samples, and these were divided into 35,600 samples that were sent all over the world for analysis. You know, geologically, the Moon's quite fascinating. But the one thing is interesting about it, too, it has no atmosphere. Now, remember, the Moon is very much smaller than the Earth. It doesn't pull so strongly has a low escape velocity, only one and a half miles a second, and therefore it couldn't hold on to any atmosphere it may once have had. Now that's uh, an orbiter picture showing the Marius Hills, and here's a picture taken by Commander Hatfield of the Moon as seen from the Earth. And you can see there there are mountains and there are craters, but everything is quite clear cut. There are no fogs, no atmosphere at all, so you can see the Moon's surface very clearly all the time. So let's have a look now, Jeremy John, at uh, the lunar makeup. Yes, here we've got the structure of the Moon. The Moon is some 2,160 miles across. In the centre we have the core, about 700 miles in diameter. And above that, between 650 and 700 miles beneath the lunar surface, we have a layer where the rocks may be molten, the asthenosphere. Above that we have the lunar mantle. And on top of that we have the lunar crust. And of course the crust is rather thicker on the far side of the Moon, the side that's permanently turned away from the Earth. And then on top of that, we had the loose surface layer, or regolith, 
between three and 60 feet thick. And we now know, of course, that that's strong enough to bear the weight of a spacecraft. And from all of the uh, rocks that were brought back by the Apollo astronauts and from the samples from the lunar probes, we have been able to examine the moon's materials, and we know that they are essentially very similar to the rocks we find on Earth. There are two main types of rocks. There are the igneous rocks. These are volcanic in origin. And then the rocks we call the lunar breccias. These are rocks which have been shattered by the effects of impacts on the surface of the moon. The youngest rocks on the moon are about 2,900 million years old. Here you can see one of the lunar seas, or maria, and that is where the youngest rocks are found. The oldest rocks are more like 4,400 million years old. The rocks from the Mari regions are dark basalts. If you can see here, a Mari region at the top compared with a highland region at the bottom. The Mari regions, dark basalts, volcanic rocks, but the highland regions at the bottom contain light grey rocks containing the mineral feldspar, anorthosites we call them. And you can see that the lunar seas at the top are much smoother and less crater scarred than the highland regions at the bottom. And the main period of lava flowing on the moon ended about 3,200 million years ago. 3,200 million years. You know, even what we call young lunar rocks are very ancient by terrestrial standards and not much has happened on the moon since then. There have been one or two spacecraft that have had a look at the moon. One of them was ROSAT, the X-ray satellite named after William Röntgen, the discoverer of X-rays, and that actually did take an image of the moon. You can see here the sunlit hemisphere of the moon is excited to fluorescence by the X-rays from the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, while the night side of the moon shadows the diffuse background of X-rays coming from distant sources far beyond. The last really good space pictures were sent back, of course, uh, by the probe Galileo. Now, Galileo is on its way to Jupiter. That's a picture of it, but it's not quite like that, unfortunately. You can see the, uh, the kind of pink thing near the top. That is the high-gain antenna, and it hasn't unfurled properly, and I'm afraid now that it won't. Galileo will get to Jupiter round about 1995, and it will send back information, although I'm afraid it's not going to be quite so efficient as we hoped. But meanwhile, on its way, it bypassed the Earth-Moon system in December 1990, and it sent back that very good lunar picture, uh, mainly of the far side. And right in the middle there, you can see that dark patch, which is the, the Mare Orientale, or the Eastern Sea. Well, um, since then, we've had one small Japanese probe, Python, and that didn't send back any pictures at all. But now at last, we've come into a new era. We have a new lunar probe at last, and this is Clementine. Yes, the Clementine spacecraft, which is already in orbit around the moon, weighing just over 300 pounds and costing some 50 million pounds. It's quite a, a low-cost spacecraft, and that uses a number of very uh, new technology components. There are new small star tracker cameras, a new guidance system, new lightweight nickel hydrogen battery, which gives out more power for its weight than any other type of battery we know. And of course, there's the new solar cell arrays. These are the lightest uh, ever flown on any spacecraft. And inside, we have a 32-bit processor in the onboard computer and a 1,600 megabyte store on board, which is used for storing the pictures for playback later. And Clementine is now safely on its way. Yes, it was launched on the 25th of January this year from the Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. There you can see it blasting off on a Titan 2G rocket. And the spacecraft carries with it an impressive array of sensors. There are four different sorts of imaging systems. There's the ultraviolet visual CCD camera. There's a near-infrared imaging system a long-wave infrared imager, that'll take thermal or heat images, and then a laser imager and ranger, the LIDAR, and that will get the highest resolution images of all. Smaller it is, there's a great deal of new technology in Clementine. The mission is scheduled to last for eight months. Two months will be spent in orbiting the moon and sending back pictures. And after that, Clementine will go on to rendezvous with a small asteroid, 1620 Geographos. Now, Clementine has been built and designed quite quickly in less than three years. But one very interesting thing is this. Although, of course, NASA is deeply concerned, the prime mover in the mission is not NASA at all, but the American Department of Defense. Yes, it might seem strange to people that Department of Defense should be interested in a spacecraft such as this. In fact, the Ballistic Missile Research Organization, which was once known as SDI, they are using the spacecraft to test these high-technology components. 
They want to test the systems that they would use for locating and tracking ballistic missiles. But because of the anti-ballistic missile treaty, they can't test these on the Earth. And so they're going to test the cameras by imaging the moon and geographos. And they're going to test the guidance systems by locating this asteroid and actually going towards it. From our point of view, a very good thing. So um, it remained in Earth orbit for two days. And then, on the 26th of January, it began its first really major manoeuvre. Yes, the kick motor was fired and it was put into a looping orbit 105,000 miles from the Earth on the 3rd of February, coming back just 170 miles away on the 5th of February, back out again in a bigger loop to just under 240,000 miles from the Earth on the 10th of February, once again looping round the Earth 700 miles away on the 15th of Feb, and that took it out to the Moon, and it actually went into orbit around the Moon on the 21st of February, and it's been going around the Moon since that time. Quite heavily, in a period of five hours. And at its closest, it swoops down to within 270 miles of the Moon, which is pretty good. So for the next two months, in March and April, it's going to spend its time going around the Moon and mapping the entire surface in strips. Yes, that's right. From its 260 by 1,830 mile orbit, the four imaging systems are going to look at the Moon. It's a polar orbit that takes it over the North and South Poles. The uh, ultraviolet visible camera will show features just 380 feet across. The near-infrared camera, some 580 feet across. And together, those two cameras will look at the surface rocks in 11 different wavelengths. And that will enable scientists to work out the proportions of the different minerals in those rocks. Meanwhile, the long-wave infrared imager will do infrared thermal maps of the moon. And of course, the laser ranger and imager, well, that will show features just 100 feet across on the surface of the moon. One interesting point is that Clementine is moving in an orbit which takes it over the lunar poles and should give us a really good view of them. And we don't know those nearly as well as we near the rest of the surface. From Earth, they're always very foreshortened. That, in fact, is an orbit picture. Now, this is a model of a lunar crater, and as you can see, part of the floor is in shadow. Near the moon's poles, there are craters which are very deep, such as the one named after Isaac Newton, and their floors never receive any sunlight at all because the sun's rays come in at an oblique angle. Therefore, the floors are always in permanent darkness. They are very, very cold indeed, and it's been suggested there may even be ice there. Now, I'm highly sceptical. The moon's rocks give no indication they've ever contained any watery material, and personally, I don't believe in lunar ice. Do you, John? No, I don't. I don't think any lunar ice will be found, but we will, of course, get the best images of the lunar poles from Clementine that we've ever had, and that will be very important in itself. So far, then, everything with Clementine is going well, but the moon mission is only part of this program. When it's complete its mapping, well, goodbye, moon, and on to a rendezvous with Geographos. That's right. It'll leave the moon's orbit on the May the 3rd. It'll then come back towards the Earth. It'll fly within just 15,000 miles of the Earth on the 6th of May, loop back out again uh, on the 16th of May. It will be 345,000 miles from the Earth, coming back again, within just 12,000 miles of the Earth on the 25th of May, and then out to the Moon, a lunar swing by on the 27th of May at a distance of 4,560 miles. And it'll then be on its way on the beginning of its five and a half million mile journey to the asteroid Geographos. It'll get there on the 31st of August. And it'll fly by at a distance of only about 60 miles, and that's closer than any previous asteroid encounter, much closer than either or Gaspar. Oh yes, much closer than those. We've said a good deal about asteroids. All the large ones keep strictly to one particular belt in the solar system between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. Only one, Ceres, is as much as 500 miles across, and only one, Vesta, is ever visible with the naked eye. We do have close-range pictures of two main belt asteroids, both taken by the Galileo probe. There is Gaspra, an irregular cratered body, and there's a slightly larger Ida. And certainly, both those are bits of larger bodies which broke up. But although all the large asteroids keep to that zone, there are smaller ones which don't. They invade the inner part of the solar system, and they may come within striking distance of the Earth. And Geographos is one of those. Yes, we call those near-Earth asteroids. And there are three main families of near-Earth asteroids. First, we have the Amor family. Their orbits cut the orbit of Mars, but don't come inside the orbit of the Earth. Then we have the Apollo family. Geographos is one of those. Their orbits do come inside that of the Earth. And thirdly, we have the Aten family. Their average distances from the Sun are less than that of the Earth. 
Geograph Force was discovered way back in 1951 by Wilson Minkowski. We know about its orbit. It goes around the sun in a path which takes it from 76 million miles out to 154 million miles in a period of 1.39 years. And the orbital inclination is 13 degrees to ours. So we know exactly how it moves. And we also know it is very small. It's very much smaller than the main belt asteroids such as Ida, which is nearly 40 miles long, or Gasper, which is about half that. Geographos is no more than two and a quarter miles across and maybe as little as one mile. So it's quite different. And when Clementine gets there, we're going to have our first near view of one of those small asteroids. Yes, on the 31st of August, Clementine will swoop within 60 miles of uh, Geographos's surface at 6.6 .6 miles a second. And in just 15 minutes, it will take 2,000 pictures of the surface <coughs> of Geographos. These will be stored on board for transmission later. The ultraviolet visible camera will show us features just 100 feet across, and the laser imager features just 15 feet across. And that's two to three times better than the best image we, we had of Gaspar and Ida. And of course, this links with the name Clementine. The song, Oh My Darling Clementine, is a mining song. And in the future, we might want to mine near-Earth asteroids. And so that's the reason for the name Clementine. I wonder if it will happen like that. Well, very small asteroids, or large meteorites, whatever they call them, they may hit us, and they may hit craters. A little while ago, I flew over Wolf Creek Crater in Australia, and that was certainly produced by an impact over 20,000 years ago. But I just wonder, if we saw one of these things approaching us, and we saw it coming in time, could we do anything about it? Well, of course, this is something that uh, many people are looking at. Uh, an asteroid collision such as this is very unlikely. We know the ast orbits of these asteroids very well, and we might be able to see that a collision shown here was likely by plotting the orbits of the Earth and the asteroid. The one thing we might be able to do is to divert the asteroid off course. Again, this is extremely difficult to do, and something we're not sure how to do at the moment. But what you'd have to do is make some form of explosion when the asteroid was travelling almost at its slowest, at its furthest point from the sun, Aphelion, and somehow nudge it off course so it no longer collided with the Earth, as you can see here. The chances of our being hit by a body large enough to do any real damage are extremely slight. After all, the Earth is a very small body in a very large area of space, so there's no need to be alarmed. Collisions like this happen very, very rarely, and there's plenty of other things to worry about rather than asteroid collisions. I'm sure you're absolutely right. Meanwhile, we wait to see with interest what Clementine is going to tell us. Don't forget, if you want the latest astronomical information, you can dial up our Sky at Night information line, 0891 800 When I come back next month, we're going to go to the other side of the world and bring you the latest news about astronomy in Australia. So until then, good night.